All right, thank you, Yikai. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I wasn't sure what to do in this talk. You're not all physicists, I guess. You're not all quantum computationalists. So I'm going to give a not very technical thought, try to give some perspective on the problem of simulating field theories, tell you about some of the things uh, we've done with uh, some collaborators and uh, some of the things we hope to do and why we're doing these things. So uh, Stephen, Keith, Ari, and I have uh, been doing work going back some years on formulating and analyzing algorithms for simulating quantum field theory. And a good question is, why do we do this? And of course, part of the answer is that quantum field theories are very fundamental in physics. The formulation of all the fundamental interactions, possibly excluding gravitation, is in terms of quantum field theory. So this type of simulation is very relevant to the question of the quantum search during thesis, the question, can the quantum computers, which we currently envision building in the coming decades, efficiently simulate any process that occurs in nature? A pleasing feature of that question is that either a yes or a no answer is exciting. If the answer is yes, then we can anticipate that, at least for physicists, uh, important application for quantum computers will be simulating field theory, simulating fundamental physics. And if the answer is no, that's even more exciting. It means our current concept of a quantum computer doesn't fully capture the computational power that's encoded in the laws of nature. But we can envision, for example, using quantum computers to simulate quantum chromodynamics from first principles so we can study scattering processes um, derived from QCD without phenomenological assumption. We can do simulations of nuclear matter with potential implications for astrophysics, like supernova explosions and properties of neutron stars. And we can explore other strongly coupled quantum field theories, which might be important for formulating models of physics beyond the standard model. And an important motivation is that simulations of quantum field theory are a stepping stone to simulations of quantum gravity, which at least in the case of quantum gravity in anti-distributed space can be formulated in terms of quantum field theory living on the ground through space time. And from the point of view of quantum gravity, it's become especially interesting to characterize in as precise a way as we can the computational complexity of quantum states, and that seems to be related to geometry and holographic duality. So thinking about how to do simulation is important for that characterization. And we hope and anticipate that both thinking about and performing simulation of quantum field theory will lead to unanticipated new insights. So when we have an algorithm, what does that mean? What kinds of problems would we want to solve? Here are some of the things that we thought about, we might want to solve a scattering problem where we're given some description of an initial state, say particles which are about to collide with one another, and we'd like to be able to sample accurately from the final states produced in the collision. Or it's often useful in field theory to formulate the problem as the amplitude for the vacuum to be preserved if we couple some sources to local observables and turn those sources on and off in some way that depends on space and time and ask for the amplitude or probability of remaining in the vacuum state. And that's related to the computation of correlation function, where it's particularly natural with the quantum computer to consider correlation functions where we insert unitary operators at specified points in space and time, but we can also consider more general operators that aren't unitary. And we would also like to do simulations at non-zero temperature, at non-zero chemical potential, and even far from equilibrium when we're investigating dynamical processes. And we might be interested in transport properties and the viscosity of nuclear matter or the quark gluon plasma or something like that. And in cases like that, it's actually fruitful to think about the problem from the point of view 
of what would you do if you were performing an experiment to investigate those properties and formulate an algorithm which is modeled on that potential experiment. I should say something about the distinction between digital and analog quantum simulation. Digital quantum simulation is something that is just beginning. It's still largely an aspiration. Analog quantum simulation has already, for a while, been an active field in both theory and experiment. And there are a number of platforms, many of the same platforms that are under consideration for building a scalable quantum computer can be used in analog simulations like ultra coal atoms and molecules, trapped ions, superconducting circuits, and so on. And there are ingenious ideas about how we could use such platforms to simulate strongly coupled physics of gauge theories, and Benny Rutnick will tell us something about that. In these simulations, it's often empowering to be able to have qubits which have high connectivity so that one qubit can interact directly with many other qubits. And there are mechanisms for achieving high connectivity in these various platforms, which provides us a potentially powerful tool for probing, for example, quantum chaos of such systems and how quantum information gets scrambled. And we'll hear more about that at this meeting. These simulations are limited by the imperfect control of the Hamiltonian of the analog simulator. And there's an interesting complexity theoretic question about whether with such a noisy system we can really access information which is hard to compute with a digital computer. And what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk, though, is digital quantum simulation. I'm going to imagine we've used fault tolerance methods to get accurate gates and good qubits, and I won't uh, worry anymore about that. Here's a little bit about quantum field theory background, if you don't know much about it. Quantum field theory was first invented soon after the arrival of quantum mechanics. Those were the days when giants walked the earth, and Dirac and Heisenberg, Holly, some of the pioneers of quantum mechanics were involved in the earliest formulations of quantum field theory. And one of the first things that was noted was that if you quantize the free electromagnetic field, you get photons. And that provided a foundation for the idea of light quanta, which up until then had been more of a heuristic concept. And because the coupling in quantum electrodynamics is weak, it's sensible to use perturbation theory, and it works pretty well when you compute things to uh, leading order. But confusion reigned for 20 years because when you try to improve those computations by going to higher order perturbation theory, infinities are encountered, which had no clear physical interpretation for a while, until the late 40s when Swinger, Feynman, Tamanaga, Dyson realized that the way to deal with the infinities was to think in a proper operational way about what you're computing that we should, if we're trying to express something we've computed in a form that can be compared with experiment, we could express the answers in terms of other experimentally acceptable quantities. And if you do that, then the infinities cancel. So if you ask the theory a sensible physical question, you get a sensible answer. So it took a lot of combinatoric agility, at least initially, largely supplied by Dyson, to see that this really works. The first efforts to turn quantum field theory into a rigorous mathematical subject occurred in the 1950s, and Whiteman in particular formulated a set of axioms that define what we mean by a relativistic quantum field theory. But the subject really took a turn around 1970, largely through the work of Ken Wilson, who taught us to think of quantum field theory as a kind of second-order phase transition. And while well, there wasn't room on the slide to point out that the formulation of the standard model then occurred in the 1970s, and it still stands as our best description of the strong and the weak interaction. So why is Ken Wilson my hero, or one of my heroes? Um, he answered the question, what is quantum field theory, in a satisfying way, and he really understood more deeply than his predecessors the meaning of renormalization. The problem of the infinities arises because quantum field theory, and this also makes it challenging to simulate, 
formally involves an infinite number of degrees of freedom per unit volume. There are modes of the field of arbitrarily short wavelengths, so it sounds like that would be pretty hard to simulate if you have an infinite number of degrees of freedom. But the key point is that if you're interested in computing things in what physicists call the infrared at long distances or low energy, there is limited sensitivity of that low energy physics to the underlying short distance physics, so you don't have to simulate the very short distance physics of the theory accurately to get accurate answers when you're computing low energy quantities. That's what we call universality. And really, when you step back and think about it, that's why we can do physics. Because if we had to understand physics at the Planck scale at 10 to the minus 35 meters to compute the properties of the hydrogen atom or the physics that's going on at the Large Hadron Collider, we'd really be stuck. Fortunately, we can do physics one scale at a time, understand a given energy scale, and still remain largely ignorant about what's going on at still higher energies. And of course, that's a two-edged sword because it means we have limited ability to probe experimentally physics at very short distances with the experimental tools that we currently have, say at the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, that doesn't help us very much in understanding physics at 10 to the minus 35 meters. And what's very relevant for our discussions at this meeting is that Wilson's insights largely flowed from his thinking in the 1960s about how to simulate a quantum field theory on a digital computer. I think it's reasonable to anticipate that we will gain further insights both from thinking about and actually doing simulations of quantum field theory on quantum computers and maybe eventually arrive at a satisfying answer to the question, what is string theory or what is quantum gravity? Maybe it's notable that the time it took between the first formulation of quantum field theory in 1927 and Wilson explaining to us what quantum field theory really is, that was about 43 years, and that's about the span of time since string theory was first proposed around 1974 as a theory of gravity to today. So we're still waiting for our Wilson to tell us what is string theory. Since there are mathematicians in the room, I'll make a comment about rigor. Well, we can rigorously define, that was the point of the Whiteman axiom, axiom to what a relativistic quantum field theory is, something we don't really know how to do for string theory. It took a while for those initial efforts, which were really non-constructive. At first, it was only known that theories satisfy Whiteman's axioms because we had the example of free field theory, which isn't very interesting. But in the 1970s, there was some success at rigorously constructing non-trivial interacting theories to satisfy the axioms. But that was limited to what we call super-renormalizable theories, which have especially uh, weak sensitivity to the short distance physics. And it's still not settled as a mathematical problem that asymptotically free quantum chromodynamics exists as a theory which satisfies the Whiteman axioms, so though we as physicists have no particular reason to doubt it. Another thing that's interesting to know is that if we consider, I'm using capital D to mean space-time dimension, so D equals 4 is where we're all living, and in, uh, with rare exceptions, in more than four space-time dimensions, quantum field theory isn't a very interesting subject because the only theories which exist are three theories. And four dimensions, in the case of uh, self-coupled scalar theory, which I'll discuss a little bit later, is kind of a marginal case. Uh, we don't think it exists in the sense of a theory satisfying all the Whiteman axioms, but it's still quite interesting to simulate it because that non-existence is a statement about its continuum limit, which I'll, I'll say a little bit more about in a minute. Um, now, when we analyze algorithms in our work, we try to be precise, but we can't be fully rigorous in everything we do. And so, in particular, when we want to estimate how the resources scale with the error in our simulations, we make use of perturbation theory in a way which we can't fully uh, rigorously justify, but it's the best we can do. 
So I should say, because there are some lattice gauge theory people in the room, maybe any lattice gauge theory people in the room? Okay. Um, you, it's important for you to be aware that when we speak of algorithms for simulating quantum systems on a quantum computer, we're talking about real-time simulation. You guys like to do simulations in imaginary time, in Euclidean space-time. Well, we wish we could do that, but uh, that's not what we know how to do. And that's too bad, because imaginary time evolution has some advantages for some purposes, like efficiently preparing ground states as quantum systems. But it's not really so bad, because you can't simulate in real time, and a quantum computer can do that. That is you, meaning you using a classical digital computer, which is why you simulate and you put it in space-time, because that's what you know how to do, and that's good for some purposes, like computing static properties, hadron mass spectrum, matrix elements of local operators, things like that, but not for studying dynamical processes, and that's where the quantum computer has its big advantage. So we work with Hamiltonians, not with a manifestly covariant formulation of the theory, like an action formulation, like we prefer to do in field theory. Uh, so typically we pick some inertial, even though we have a relativistic theory, then there's a Hamiltonian, and we try to be careful to extract results at the end, which really are independent of the reference frame that we chose. So here's a Typical, this sort of echoes what Andrew said, a typical quantum simulation task would be to prepare some initial state whose evolution we want to study in our quantum computer, like an incoming scattering state if we're trying to study some scattering process, and then to evolve the state forward in time using the Hamiltonian in some particular reference frame that we've chosen. And then at the end, we measure an observable, maybe a simulation of the detector that would be used in an experiment. And the goal of the simulation is to sample accurately from the probability distribution of outcomes of that measurement in the ideal system. And the error is a measure of how close the probability distribution that we're sampling from is to the ideal distribution. And then we, as theorists, consider how the computational resources needed for the simulation scale with various parameters, like that error, the size of the system that we're simulating, the number of particles involved, the total energy of the process, the mass gap, if there is one, that is the mass of the lightest particle. And the resources we're typically interested in are the number of qubits or the number of gates, in some cases the circuit depth, if it's a highly parallelizable simulation. And what we uh, hope to show is that everything, um, all the resources needed scale polynomially with those measures of the input to the problem. And we're really happy if we can get something which is uh, poly log in some of the parameters, like the errors and we discussed. So this really is still the killer app among those we know for quantum computers, that is simulation of quantum systems as Feynman had emphasized. Of course, the question is, what's the right thing to simulate to give us interesting information to make good use of our quantum computational resources, and what kinds of things can we learn from doing so? So I said you start out by preparing a ground state, or preparing some initial state. It doesn't have to be a ground state. But if it is a ground state, uh, even that, can be a hard problem for some local Hamiltonians, local in the sense that Andrew described, the sum of terms which uh, couple together some constant number of degrees of freedom. And we know that even, we've known it for decades, for classical systems, that for example, finding the lowest energy state of spin glass, an Ising-like spin glass where neighboring spins have couplings that can be either ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic, and there's also some local magnetic field. Even in two dimensions, that's a hard problem because we can encode a satisfiability problem uh, in that system, which is, as we say, NP-hard, as hard as any problem whose solution we can check efficiently with the classical computer. And things are even worse for quantum systems. The problem can be what we call QMA hard, which we think is even harder than NP hard. It's hard as any problem whose solution can be verified with a quantum computer. Um, and that's true even in one dimension. If we have 
Uh, finite dimensional systems on the line with only the nearest neighbor interaction. It's not qubits, but um, I don't know how, how high dimensional they have to be. Nine dimensional or something like that would be a QMA hard problem in the worst case. And so we shouldn't be too worried about that. Well, we can worry about it, but we don't have to be too discouraged if our goal is to simulate nature because the states which we think exist in nature are not ones which are NP hard or QMA hard to prepare or else where do they come from? So the same thing goes for Gibbs state that non-zero temperature it may be that it's hard to prepare the equilibrium state for some local Hamiltonian. Um, in the case of a spin glass, uh, that might be true if the temperature is low enough. Well, we don't necessarily care if we want to simulate nature because those, those systems don't reach equilibrium except after an exponentially long time. So we tend to think that the states that we see around us in the universe are easy to prepare in the, in the sense of computational complexity. Whether they really are is a question about cosmology. And maybe we'll have further discussion of that at this meeting. So why don't I just do what Andrew does? I anticipated he would give, a, you know, characteristically a brilliant summary of a, a beautiful body of work, and doesn't that just solve everything? Well, what uh, Andrew had these marvelous results on uh, the scaling with the air, uh, which is essentially optimal, and uh, the scaling with the, uh, you know, the resource cost of simulating for time t, which is essentially optimal in the evolution time. And so why can't we just borrow those results? To some extent, we can. But Hebrew's results apply, as he said, to something like a spin system on a lattice, where we have some finite dimensional system, some uh, constant number of qubits at each lattice site. And it's not necessarily geometrically local, but uh, each site coupled to some constant number of other sites in the uh, Hamiltonian, and then these results apply. Um, in quantum field theory, that's not exactly the situation we're in. Uh, we have formally an unbounded number of sites per unit volume. We have unbounded operators of each site. So if we want to plug in the types of results that Andrew discussed, we have some work to do to tame the problem so those results become applicable. So this is the question of how you regulate a quantum field theory and turn it into an animal that we know how to simulate. And there are different ways you could consider doing that. Uh, you might work directly in momentum space, and in a way that's kind of natural, it's by going to momentum space that we solve free theories. They're translational, uh, translationally invariant. We can Fourier transform to diagonalize the Hamiltonian and and the ground state in particular, we can formulate perturbation theory and the renormalization group in momentum space. But it seems the real space is really more suitable if we want to do a simulation we can do on a computer because the Hamiltonians that we typically want to consider are spatially local. The interactions are local in space-time. And so we can take advantage of that by simulating the system in real space rather than momentum space. So in order to have a finite number of degrees of freedom per unit volume, we first of all introduce a spatial lattice with some spatial lattice spacing, which is just an artifice. It doesn't reflect anything fundamental about the problem, but it's a device for doing the simulation. And then we can write down the Hamiltonian in terms of those lattice variables. The parameters in that Hamiltonian are what we sometimes call bare parameters. That means they don't correspond very directly to anything you could measure with low energy, but they define what the Hamiltonian is and what the problem is. And uh, if we make the lattice spacing smaller, that's better because we can get higher accuracy that way, but it's more costly because it means we're going to need more qubits per unit of spatial volume. And even when we introduce the lattice, we're not done because the field and their conjugate momenta live on the lattice sites, and they are unbounded operators, so we have to approximate them with some finite number of qubits, uh, which we can justify if the total energy of the process we want to study is sufficiently low. Now, it's a good question whether we can regulate in more clever ways than we have in, in the work we've published so far. I'm sure uh, there are better methods. 
And in fact, the lattice community knows a lot about renormalization group improvement of lattice action in order to, in effect, make the physical size of the lattice spacing and physical units larger, which means a lower resource requirement for a simulation with a given accuracy at a given scale. And now we have all these uh, interesting ideas which have been developed and studied particularly in the condensed matter community in recent years uh, for doing renormalization of Hamiltonians in more sophisticated ways using tensor networks, wavelet ideas, and special types of tensor networks which are inviting us to uh, apply them to field theory problems, but that topic is still in its early stages. You thought I was going to go through the whole talk without an equation, right? Here's one. So here's an example of something we might want to simulate. It's just a self-coupled scalar field. This is a Hamiltonian uh, written in continuum language. Phi is a field variable. There's one at each uh, point in space. And uh, pi is the conjugate momentum. So those are like the, the Q and P of this system, which will be a canonical commutation relation. Um, if we didn't have this last term, this would be an easy problem. It would be a Gaussian system. Um, it would be easy to simulate classically. We know how to do that. From a particle physics perspective, it would be a theory of non-interacting particles, which is why it's so easy. And when we introduce the phi to the fourth term, it becomes a lot more interesting. That allows particles to scatter. I've written the uh, subscript zero on m squared, the m being the mass of particle and lambda, this coupling parameter, to emphasize that these are the bare parameters. They don't necessarily correspond to the physical mass of the particle or the scattering rate you would observe in a low energy process. The dimensionless parameter of interest is the dimensionless parameter you can form out of lambda and m, and that's a measure of how important quantum fluctuations are in the system. If that's a small parameter, then for some purposes we can do perturbation theory to do accurate calculations, but classical simulations become hard when quantum fluctuations are large and that parameter is uh, order one rather than a small number, then we're in the regime where we don't have good classical methods for simulating dynamical processes. Yes? Well, so our, the methods of simulation that we're using are for the most part intrinsically non-perturbative. They might match up pretty well with perturbative computations depending on what we're computing, but in the case where, you know, the coupling, the dimensionless coupling is of order one, we really don't have a good classical method to compare it to because perturbation theory fails so miserably. Yes, we do, uh, that, that was, it's a cheat, and so when I said we, uh, in order to estimate errors um, and how they scale with the lattice spacing, we use effective field theory methods, which are really perturbative, because we don't know how to do better than that. Yeah, that's right. I, maybe that's not on this slide, but I was going to say something about tuning later. It's coming. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Stephen, I think, will explain more about this. The problem can remain hard even when coupling is weak, and you might think perturbative methods are uh, accurate if we want very high precision. Perturbation theory has limited precision, even if we carry it out to high order. Um, or if we consider processes in which particles interact for a sufficiently long time for many particles to become highly entangled, and then there isn't any distinct classical description of the system and no good classical simulation methods. Um, we're going to assume, we have assumed in our work, that there's a mass gap, that is that the physical mass of the lightest particle is positive, and uh, that makes the simulation easier in some respects. So here's an example of a simulation protocol that uh, we can study and have studied. If we're interested in studying some scattering process, we can have as an input some list of momenta, say, or some description of quantum state of some incoming particles. 
and we might be interested in an output which is a list of outgoing particles and their momenta or some other description of their final state. And one way of doing that is we could start by preparing the vacuum of the free theory. That's a Gaussian theory. We have to prepare some Gaussian state. We know how to do that on a quantum computer. And we can also prepare wave packets in the free theory, essentially by simulating the interaction of a two-level atom with the fields to produce those wave packets. But we're interested in the interacting theory, and so what we can do is adiabatically turn on the coupling, so the coupling becomes time-dependent for some time. And we don't want the wave packets to spread too much or propagate too much during that time, so we have a method for tethering the wave packets so they more or less stay in place while we're wrapping up the interaction. Then we evolve for some time using methods similar to uh, what Andrew described. Um, and then we can adiabatically turn off the interaction and use standard quantum computing tools to make measurement of the different field nodes to uh, see what the final particle distribution is. Um, that, this is all assuming that there isn't some phase transition which occurs as we do the adiabatic state preparation or some level crossing that could cause the adiabatic method to be very expensive. And there are other things we can do, like we could prepare the vacuum of the interacting theory and then introduce sources, and Stephen will say something about this as well, where we introduce particles directly of the interacting theory, which is, has advantages in some situations. Uh, we could simulate as our final readout some kind of detector PLVM rather than trying to produce some list of final state momentum. Now, we break Lorentz invariance very badly when we put the theory on the lattice and formulate it as a Hamiltonian theory, and we have to do some tuning of parameters to get the Lorentz invariant theory that we really want to study. And for that matter, it requires some tuning of the lattice Hamiltonian to get the uh, particles to be light compared to the natural scale of mass, which is 1 over the lattice spacing. But that's the famous problem of naturalness in quantum field theory, which is why we were sure there'd be so much new physics at the Large Hadron Collider. It's hard to explain why the Higgs boson is so light compared to other fundamental scales. We have that problem, too, and we have to deal with it by some tuning of Hamiltonian, for this particular theory, at any rate. And then the sources of error that we need to worry about um, include these. We're working at a non-zero lattice spacing, but we really want to study a continuum theory, formally a theory in a continuum limit. We work with some finite spatial volume. We have discretized the fields and the conjugate momenta at each lattice site. We're, used, we're using a uh, what Andrew called a product formula simulation, a higher order broader approximation to simulate the time evolution. That's another source of error, as we discussed. And we also have to worry about departures from perfect adiabaticity when we turn on and off coupling parameters. So here's an example of the setting in which we can analyze these things. But suppose it's uh, that self-coupled scalar field theory uh, that I described. Uh, let's say it's in 2 plus 1 space-time dimension. That's the super renormalizable case where things are rigorously known about this theory. Uh, well, one source of error is the um, non-zero lattice spacing, and we use effective field theory methods, which are essentially perturbative, to argue that that introduces an error which scales with the lattice spacing. We can make the lattice spacing smaller, and that improves the error. But the number of qubits that we need also scales inversely with the lattice spacing. So in this case, the number of qubits we need to get a specified accuracy uh, scale like one over the error. So one of the things we have to do is that Gaussian state preparation. And if we use a general purpose method for making Gaussian state, which essentially involves matrix arithmetic, the cost of that goes like uh, some power between two and three of uh, the number of qubits participating in that Gaussian state. So uh, the scaling with the error of that step would go like uh, one over epsilon to that power, and actually there's a better way of doing that state preparation taking advantage of translation invariance, but we didn't discuss that in our paper. 
You can also ask about how the resources need needed scale with the energy of the process. And in the uh, analysis that we published, we got an upper bound of um, energy to the sixth for the number of gates that are needed, and I won't discuss that in detail. But one thing is that at higher energy, we need to choose a stronger time step, a stronger trotter uh, step in order to uh, maintain the desired accuracy. Uh, when the energy gets higher, we need to make the lattice spacing smaller in order to resolve shorter wavelength physics. And we have to worry about the diabatic error that occurs when the energy is higher. But we do things the way I described, where we have some wave packet of the free theory and then we turn on the interaction. Um, it would actually be kinematically allowed for massless particles for a single particle to split into three particles all moving collinearly. And correspondingly, when the energy is large compared to the mass, the energy gap for that process gets small. So as the energy goes up, we have to go slower in order to uh, avoid unwanted uh, production of particles. So we have not done as detailed resource estimates as Andrew described, but even if you want to do something kind of modest in a theory like this, like study the uh, scattering of two particles to produce four particles with about a 1% error, um, oh, oh yeah, thousands of logical qubits. You need thousands of logical qubits, and uh, I don't even want to talk about how many gates uh, to do that. So that, that's kind of discouraging, so we'd certainly like to find more uh, resource economical methods. Um, so certainly one of the things that uh, requires further thought is improving the resource cost of such simulations, uh, dealing with uh, systems that have phase transitions, making the analysis more kosher and uh, raising the level of rigor. And as I mentioned, we have potential methods for renormalization group improvement and more clever lattice regularization of field theories, which might help a lot. As um, Andrew emphasized, we really should think seriously about what kinds of simulations are potentially useful with the relatively near-term devices, which probably will not have fault tolerance, so we'll have to be able to tolerate reasonably high um, error rates um, per gate, and are there still interesting simulations that we can do? I haven't talked about the challenge of simulating gauge theories, where as we evolve and do state preparation, we want to maintain gauge invariance. We need methods for dealing with systems which have massless particles, like photons. If we use adiabatic methods for state preparation, we'll always produce lots of very soft massless particles. That isn't necessarily so terrible, but we have to think about what the right criterion is for an accurate simulation, depending on what observable we're measuring, we don't necessarily care about a lot of very soft particles uh, in the background. Uh, it's interesting to think about putting supersymmetry on the lattice. Chiral fermions is an important challenge. The standard model has chiral fermions with left-handed and right-handed fermions transforming differently, uh, carrying different charges. Typically, when you put fermions on the lattice, so you get non-chiral theory. Um, but actually, uh, there are some good ideas which have come out of recent progress in understanding symmetry-protected topological phases, which can be brought to bear on that problem. Um, in particular, actually, it's a rather old idea that if I want to study chiral fermions, I can consider a system which has one extra dimension, and then the left-handed fermions will be on one edge of the sample, the right-handed fermions on the other edge. The newer idea is that by introducing strong interactions on one of the edges, we can gap out that edge and get rid of the chiral fermions on one edge, pushing them up to very high mass, comparable to the lattice spacing, and keep the light chiral fermions that, uh, that we want for our simulation. That's an important conceptual problem, an important problem of principle, because we still don't have some fully convincing 
arguments that uh, hypofermions really exist in a continuum theory, I think that's a problem which is on the verge of being solved. We'd like to study conformal field theories and get insights into holography, into quantum chaos. Um, there may be um, methods quite different from the one I described, which is kind of a brute force simulation for using a quantum computer to speed up computations of correlators, say, in conformal field theory. Um, and I think we have an opportunity to think in a fresh way about quantum fault tolerance, specifically in the context of quantum simulation and state preparation and evolution, uh, the issues that evolve and or that arise in doing a uh, fault tolerance simulation are a little bit different than for general purpose quantum circuits, and we might be able to take advantage of that. So I guess I it's probably I'm not revealing a secret if I say that my own motivation for studying this problem has for some years been that we would like to be able to simulate quantum gravity. I think that's really a great opportunity, both at the conceptual level and eventually something that we can do with quantum computers. Um, and that's related to the study of quantum chaos, uh, which I mentioned here. You know, I think there's also a great opportunity for quantum simulations to deepen our understanding of quantum chaos. If you look back at the history of classical chaos, the roots of the subject go back well over a hundred years, but it wasn't until digital computers were able to do interesting simulations of dynamical systems in the 60s and 70s that the topic really took off, and it may be that quantum simulations of chaotic quantum systems will give a similar boost to our understanding of quantum chaos. And I think the circle of ideas, which I think others will talk about more, relating quantum information, quantum entanglement, emergent geometry, and this is the greatest opportunity for a big step forward in theoretical physics, I think, that exists right now. And this is where I, quantum computers could potentially really alter the course of high energy physics through quantum simulations of quantum gravity. All right, thanks for listening.